<laughs> Since the, uh, the last, the first Mises University was last summer about this time, <clears throat> And since, the, uh, since, that, uh, since that event, uh, we've, had a, we've gone through cataclysmic changes in, in the world. And uh, the, um, what we've seen, I think, in this last part of last year and, and, and continuing this year is the most exciting event in the 20th century, certainly in my lifetime, I think, in the 20th century, namely the total revolutionary collapse of socialism-communism. And uh, it's a, it, was just, it, was just, it was just fantastic, and that's part of the... Uh, Part of the case uh, for optimism about the future, <coughs> excuse me, um, is the is the fact that uh, something happened which nobody nobody had predicted would happen in any sort, at least at that time, and in, in, in that sort of way, is that uh, we had a totalitarian monolith. Uh, uh, one one friend of mine claimed about two three years ago that communism has succeeded in brainwashing all the people, all their subjects, so they created a new socialist man, the, the man that they were trying to achieve, and therefore everything was hopeless. And uh, typical of this person is he, he's not exactly a very good prophet. And uh, shortly after the, the, his article was written, uh, you know, came the beginnings of the whole collapse of communism. And uh, one of the great things about it, in addition to the fact that it shows that the spirit of freedom cannot be wiped out, in, in mankind, uh, is that it shows the power of ideas. You know, that it's very difficult. We tend to get pessimistic sometimes. Some people do. Some uh, uh, laggards. Some of the faint of heart. <clears throat> because here we're pouring forth ideas, and Mises, for example, I'll get to that in a minute, that uh, all of his life was fighting for freedom and uh, opposed to tyranny and socialism. And uh, you think, well, how can ideas affect history? <clears throat> and we're locked in. You know, of course, we all know about the public choice trap. Um, the public choicers, who tend to be free market people, are, are trapped in this uh, extremely gloomy, pessimistic out world outlook, namely that uh, special privileges, of course, as we all know, special privileges out to uh, uh, shaft us 24 hours a day. The, the, they're, they're, they're constantly working for lobbying and special privileges and, and monopoly and contracts and all that. And the rest of us, the consumers, the average person, is not interested in any one particular focus, like the sugar market or the grain market or whatever, 24 hours a day. And therefore, uh, the consumer is, quote, rationally ignorant, ignorant unquote, and uh, uncaring about these particular, particular uh, fields and areas. And therefore, uh, it's inevitable the special privileges always went out, and tyranny and statism went out, and that's it. There's no hope. And every, every person, since every person is only interested in their narrow, short-run economic interests, there's no way of getting out of this trap. Uh, George Stiegler, for example, the distinguished dean of Chicago School of Economics, or one of the two deans at least, uh, uh, view is that ideas have no influence on history whatsoever. I mean, it's as if everybody's writing in a sort of a vacuum or writing for each other, other professors. Uh, and uh, and there's, no, there's, no, there's no point to any of this as far as affecting history goes. Uh, and coming from a historian of economic thought, it's kind of a you know kind of a depressing picture. Right, so, so why why are you doing all this if none of this has any impact? So, uh, but we find out here a dramatic example of the exact opposite. In other words, here is uh, here the communist. He was the communist system, totally locked in, and I say alleged monolith, <clears throat> special privileges of nomenclatura, totally dominant. Uh, Everybody had to, had to work for the state. Everybody's lives were organized by the state and commanded by the state. And therefore, there seemed to be no hope. And um, obviously, something, and here's a situation where people like Ludwig von Mises, for example, uh, Etienne Laboa T., David Hume, and Ludwig von Mises always kept insisting uh, that in the long run, ideas are the things that count. It's not, it's not short run economic interests, it's the ideas of the, held by the public uh, that determine historical events. That no, no, uh, no government has as much, um, however much force they command, however much rain, um, instruments of terror they use on the population, no government can last any length of time unless the public supports it. The majority of the public endorses it one way or the other for whatever reason. And this seemed to be outmoded in the days of, te of totalitarianism, the days when the government has always dread instruments of torture and te high technology at their command. How can the average person uh, Resist this, and you, you know we've all read Orwell's 1984. Of course, it's a very gloomy picture. Everything is shot. Everything is finished. Uh, the totalitarian elite will win out. And in, at the beginning of all this process, Ludwig von Mises in 1920 wrote his famous article, uh, an economic calculation of socialist commonwealth, 
uh, the beginning of this whole monstrous pro collectivist process in the 20th century, and he said, uh, it's not going to work. In other words, in addition to the moral ideas, the moral failures of socialism, and, the, and, the, and all the other and the political philosophic failures and sociological failures, this ain't going to work. Uh, socialism is impossible, as he put it, and cannot plan a modern industrial system. It's going to fall apart. Can't calculate. And uh, <clears throat> this was uh, uh, allegedly rebutted. The socialists, by the way, in those days took this very seriously. This is the first time they've come to their attention as a, as a problem other than the incentive problem. You know about the incentive problem. Everybody acknowledged that from the very beginning of socialism, even, even before socialism. The, the great socialist, socialist experiment of the Soviet Union was established. The center problem is uh, if everybody's equal and if everybody takes according to his needs and gives according to his ability, who's going to take out the garbage? Who's going to do the, who's going to do the dirty work? What's, who's going to, what's going to happen? And the answer basically, <clears throat> if you think of the socialist was, we will create, or socialism will create uh, a new socialist man, which will, do, will be cheerful and robotic and dedicating his whole life to the service of the state apparatus. And, uh, Essentially, Mises said, look, even setting that aside, whether or not you can do that, even, even having a bunch of robots who are cheerfully uh, rushing to the, obey the commands of the state, what, is the state, what will the state be able to tell them? What will the state tell them to do? How, how will they be able to plan and calculate and where some, where some production should be established and what tech processes should be used and what, and what combinations and so forth? And he said they can't do it because there's no, there's no free market on the means of production. There's no genuine market which establishes a genuine price system, and therefore they won't know their cost, they won't know if they're doing well or badly, and the whole thing will fall apart. The socialists taking this very seriously try to refute it. We had about 20 years or 15 years of uh, debate back and forth, especially in Europe, where Mises, of course, was published. The uh, conclusion, which was accepted by every right-thinking economist by the late 30s was, that's okay, we can have a market socialism, we can tell the managers to play, play market, and so forth and so on. And this was generally accepted uh, by the uh, establishment. <clears throat> and uh, everybody sat back, well, that, phew, that, that problem is disposed of. We don't have to worry anymore. Socialism is OK. We just have this artificial market, so-called market. And Mises kept refuted that in human action. And the, but but the, 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 the economic establishment, so to speak, determined that the, the whole problem was over. Don't worry about it. Socialism can do it. Well, here we are. And, and by, at the end, the last, one of his last articles in his life, Oscar Longa, uh, and a monstrous little article called The Computer on the Market uh, really refuted his whole, his whole approach. He had said in his, in his economic theory of socialism, we don't have to worry, socialism does, doesn't have to worry about calculation. We just have a, a phony market, we have trial and error, and uh, we can do it very easily. And then he's, in 1963, just before, or 65, I guess, just before, he, before, excuse me, just before he died, he said, we don't have to worry. Now, if I, if I was writing my answer to Mises and Hayek today, I'd simply say, look, we have the computer, the great new institution, great new mechanism, which will plan everything in two seconds. In fact, it's better than the market. I don't have to worry about it. And then he, then he uh, passed on. At any rate, we now find a, in, in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union a fantastic demonstration of vindication of Mises' whole approach. Uh, the whole thing collapsed. It turns out socialism is indeed impossible. And popping up from this from this rubble, we, we found a whole an enormous, I mean, un unbelievable, to, un un unbelievable to all of us, an enormous outcropping and outpouring of, of Misesians and Hayekians all over Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And, uh, and uh, one of the physical embodiments of that, of course, was here this week, the wonderful Yuri Maltsev, I'm sure, I'm sure you've all met. And, uh, and uh, here he is, he's now, he's now honored in the Soviet Union as a, as a, as a prophet, and they want him back. <laughs> Come back and help us plan and so forth. Of course, Yuri's too shrewd for that. <laughs> <laughs> to me, one of the most moving, um, and this is, by the way, an example of how the Mises Institute works. Uh, and one of the most mov moving examples of, of, of both the Mises Institute and this, de this unbelievable desocialization occurred this spring, April or May, when. Um, Mises Institute put on a desocialization conference in Washington, and it was like a People's International. We had uh, we had a discussion of of a plan, uh, socialist planning in Eastern Europe. <clears throat> Yuri talked about the Soviet Union, and Hans Hoppe talked about Germany. And uh, we had a great guy who was a Polish American who emigrated from Poland in the early '80s, talking about the Polish Polish planning. And uh, we also had a, a uh, <clears throat> 
some, a, a, a top economist from Lithuania. It was a very moving, one of the most moving experiences I've ever had because this is, everybody thought the Russian tax would be moving in in about you know, any, any day. And we had a Lithuanian economic delegation, not, to, not worried, not seemingly not worried about the tax at all. What they want to do, how do you privatize? How do you get to a total privatization, a total free market? How do you do it? Interesting question. This is, it's a question, of course, that Orthodox economists have never thought about because they never thought it would happen. Uh, never, never, and all these millions of dollars that have been poured into anti-communist think tanks uh, over the last 40 years, for 40, 50, 45 years or so, uh, figuring out about missile weights and throw weights and who should, who should bomb whose missile first and where and so forth. The whole thing, you know, seems to be, a, right now, you're looking back at it, it seems to be like a, like a, like a 16, looking at the back of the 16th century. The whole, whole world has changed in one year. And the whole throughway thing looks like a fantastic waste of, of resources poured into this stuff. And in, in, in the midst of all this anti-communist research, nobody, as far as I know, no, none of these think tanks, none of these... Uh, uh, anti-communist foundations or whatever, no, nobody ever sat down and thought, well, what would happen if, if the Russians suddenly you know, read Human Action or read Milton Friedman or something and came to the to Western economists and said, okay, here's the key, do something about it. We surrender, <laughs> right? <clears throat> Communism is finished, what do we do next? And none of these guys ever thought about it. Because for one thing, they thought, they never absorbed the lesson of Ludwig von Mises, they never absorbed the fact that socialism can't work and eventually it is gonna collapse. And eventually they are gonna surrender one way or the other. They're going to ask for, what, what are we going to do? And they had no answer for it after 45 years of anti-communist scholarship. Okay. And uh, well, what happened, the, the, the Lithuanian economists, a whole delegation, I think, headed by Vice Premier, they were going around the, uh, the United States, the East Coast, trying to find out, how do we, what do we do? And uh, other think tanks, I might, I might add, what they did was they, they, uh, they showed them their great offices, uh, the walkie-talkies and the plush carpets, they were, of course, were very impressed with Lithuanians, but they were interested, they were interested in knowledge. They didn't, weren't really interested. They knew that the West was a great technological shape. They were interested in how did we apply that here? And only the Mises Institute, in this point, a, ideo, a great ideological entrepreneurship of Jeff Tucker, uh, immediately whipped together a, a, a prompt a one-day conference of a whole bunch of economists of, and lecturing to these Lithuanians on, on their different economic topics. And they loved it. They, this, is, you know, this is knowledge. This is what we came for. We didn't come to admire plush offices. This is, uh, we knew all about that. And when I was at this uh, Mises Institute conference a, little, a few weeks later, in the first delegation, uh, I say it was one of the most moving experiences in my life because they, all these people talked about the different aspects of Eastern Europe. And a uh, Lithuanian gentleman who, who thought he couldn't speak English well enough, obviously he did, but he was hesitant about speaking English to the group, uh, he spoke in Russian, and Yuri stood next to him translating into, into English. It was marvelous, because here's the Lithuanian-Russian people's free market solidarity. <laughs> While, <clears throat> While Soviet tanks were threatening to march in. And uh, one thing the Lithuanian uh, economist said, he said, well, this is very, it was wonderful thing I want to hear today because Professor Samuelson at MIT told us we should have a central bank. The first thing we should do is establish a central bank in Lithuania. <laughs> and, uh, and we did that. Now I found out, we find out today we should repeal the central bank. We're going to do it. We're not going to have any central bank. <laughs> <clears throat> so here, here's an you know, a beautiful example of the influence of ideas on history. And um, the... Um, and and uh, he, he said that, uh, well, that's, and he said, uh, one, one thing I should say that is that the, uh, I was going to remark before, that the whole, the whole implosion, the whole revolutionary implosion in Eastern Europe uh, shows the, the powerful influence of ideas, because they simply said, we, we're nuts to you, we're not going to obey orders anymore. It's like a, it was like nonviolent, mass civil disobedience on a fantastic scale. Uh, and... Uh, and so here we have, uh, uh, as I say, no, no, nobody could predict the exact form of this, but here it was like a domino effect. One country topples, communism topples, and the rest of them topple. Uh, the, um, and the form it took was once it's, we, well, for example, in Romania, it was a dramatic example because the troops were shooting, in, uh, Ceausescu troops were shooting into the square, and these the people, they didn't flee. They just stood there and they said, you know, the heck with it, we'd rather die than live under communism anymore. And that was it. At that point, the soldiers turned their guns on the officers and the whole thing. Uh, and we had a point where Ceausescu issue, issued orders and nobody listened to them. This is the, the great libertarian's dream, you know. The, 
the, that the guys on the top are who ordering and butchering millions of people, all of a sudden they issue orders and nobody, everybody says, nuts to you. That's the, uh, we ain't listening no more. So we have a, the, it's, it's impossible, I think, not to be optimistic when we see this. We're, 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 we're lot, we have a lot of things to gripe about here. We have a lot of uh, monstrous trends at work and in the United States. When we see what, what happened with the, under totalitarianism, when people just said, how well that we quit, and are looking for free market solutions, and, 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 and when Misesian's Hayekian is popping up, it's, it's a magnificent experience. It's something we should never forget. If we tend, ever tend to be pessimistic about trends in the United States, we should realize what, they, what happened in Eastern Europe in 1989, 1990. So in, in looking at this, and then looking at the, the victory of freedom in Eastern Europe, I'm not saying all, obviously not all problems are solved. This is an unbelievable and fantastic thing. We should always remember that ideas can always, con ideas in the long run can trump interests and Trump economic interests. Uh, the, um, looking back at this, at, the, at Mises being the, the originator of, of this, the, of, the, of, the, of the knowledge that socialism is impossible and can't work, uh, I think we should look back on Mises' life and, and, and what happened, and the events in the, in the Western economics to see, to gauge the future, we have to look at what's, what's been happening in, in the recent immediate past. Uh, as I said, after when collectivism was being established, and socialism was being established in, each, in, uh, in the world, in Europe, uh, Mises wrote this article. In addition to that, he was uh, discriminated against. He was, uh, couldn't get a university post, an Austria paid university post. He got an unpaid post, prestigious but unpaid, which meant, of course, he had to uh, find work elsewhere, largely because he was opposed to socialism and, and collectivism. And uh, there were only two kinds of uh, economists or social scientists who received paid university posts in Austria at the time. Uh, either Marx, Marxists or fascists or corporatists, that's it. They were the only respectable. Those, those, that was the wave of the future. And uh, the laissez-faire was, was reactionary, Neanderthal, and part of the 19th century, which was being dis displaced by the great progressive new century, the 20th century. So uh, in addition to that, the second thing which disqualified Mises from a, university, a paid university post was he was uncompromising. He was a great guy. I mean, he was... Uh, He's sometimes been accused of being personally abrasive. I never saw it. Those of us who studied under him in, uh, in the United States, uh, he was unbelievably sweet. He was, he was constantly uh, urging people, finding research projects for people to, to do, uh, which he usually didn't do, of course, but always coming up with, with ideas and always being unfailingly courteous and, un, and, and unfailingly uh, and non-bitter about what had happened to him. And uh, so here he was, and, but he refused to compromise one iota. In other words, he didn't... He didn't uh, Bend with the wind, with intellectual winds, which all too ho often happens in the world, as we all know. Uh, he didn't say, well, let's, let's, let's try to work within the system and say uh, statism is okay, but you should have a little bit of tinkering here and there, like a little currency reform or a little uh, you know, wage reform or, some, or something like that. He was absolutely uncompromising and, and, and kept developing his ideas and, and, his, and his great works. And in the meantime, not having a paid university post, he had a full-time post as uh, economist chief economist for the Chamber of Commerce, which in Austria was a uh, quasi a government agency which where businessmen elected uh, uh, representatives of this chamber and they would have a staff and they would advise the government. As a result, Mises uh, became uh, the, the major economic advisor, although his advice wasn't listened to very much, he was tremendously respected. So uh, uh, he almost single-handed, he and a couple of friends of his were essentially single-handedly stopped the Austrian inflation, which is rampant as well as the German after World War I, stopped it from a runaway inflation. He stopped it at, what, 1,200% or whatever, instead of, uh, instead of you know, becoming, one, as in Germany, one quadrillion marks to the dollar. There was only 1,200 Austrian shillings or whatever, fennegs, whatever the currency unit was, to the dollar. Later in his memoirs, which was written in the, in the midst of his flight from Europe in 1940, he, uh, he said, he, now he, looking back on it, he wishes that he hadn't fought it because it was better, because it was, Hopeless in the long run, anyway, because the, they just it just lengthened the time of the inflation, just slowed it down, and the result was the part of you know the banking crash and collapse in 1931. But uh, as a matter of fact, one of the very sweetest things, one of the most charming and moving uh, passages in his book, he said he's always been accused of being too uncompromising. If only it, if only it waffled, he might have been more influential. And looking back on it, he's, he said, no, no, I wasn't hard, I wasn't hardcore enough. I wasn't uncompromising enough. Looking back on it, I should have been tougher. <laughs> He comes to the United States as a refugee. Again, gets no, no paid academic post in the United States. 
uh, despite his tremendous creativity and, not, and un unbelievable erudition, at a time when every Marxist, semi-Marxist, uh, social democrat, Menshevik, Trotskyite, uh, whatever, Bukharanite uh, refugee got top academic posts, was fed and welcomed uh, at, at top universities. Uh, fortunately, at that time, we had, uh, well, we, he got a small, a small foundation grant in New York, penniless, small foundation grant to work on two great books, which came out in a couple of years. Uh, Mises, by the way, the sort of person who got a grant, and in two years, it was a book. <laughs> and uh, something which many of us try to emulate. <laughs> and uh, two great books, Bureaucracy, a, a still a magnificent book, explaining the difference between pro the workings of profit uh, operation, uh, pr private profit and loss operation, and government operation, which has to be bureaucratic, as he said, and nonprofit organization. I'll get back to that in a minute, because uh, uh, there's a whole uncharted area, which Austrian economists haven't dealt with, nobody else has dealt with, really, is of the economics of nonprofit organizations. How do they work? Is it possible for them to be efficient? Uh, and Mises pioneered in that. And also his book, Omnipotent Government, uh, which at the time was extremely important and influential, because he was the first one to show, in those days, the, the ruling doctrine here, uh, uh, promulgated by a Marxist refugee from Europe, Germany, uh, was that Nazism was the, simply the last final stage of evil capitalism. It was a capitalist turn to the Nazis to crush the, the rising proletariat. And that's the basic explanation of Nazism. And what Mises pointed out was, this is ridiculous, what Nazism really is, is national socialism. It's a form of socialism and collectivism with a, you know, in, in the German nation. After that, uh, he was really adrift, and what happened was there was a small group of, uh, there was a foundation, a small group of uh, conservative and libertarian businessmen who banded together, and, and, and uh, actually the William Volcker Fund, uh, which is the head of this, the William Volcker Fund is an unsung, forgotten institution, which really was like the candle in the catacombs or whatever. It preserved, uh, <clears throat> maintained, and fostered all well, during the 1950s and early 60s, late 40s to early 60s, uh, libertarian and conservative scholars. That was a period, you have to realize, there ain't no such thing as free market economists or, or so social scientists or anything. Everybody was either, in the ruling fashion was you either a communist or communist fellow traveler or you're a social democrat, that's it. That was the only, that was the range of debate. Are you, are you a social democrat or, you, or you, are you a commie? Being a free market person was being some sort of 19th century reactionary fascist Neanderthal. <laughs> so, uh, Harold Luno, <clears throat> the head of the Volcker Fund, uh, was searching around for, for his first task, he felt, was to find a paid university post in the United States for Mises and Hayek. Hayek was in England. Hayek had a post in England. Mises had no position at all. The result of which, of, of this detailed search, was he couldn't find a paid university post for either of them, interestingly enough. And uh, in other words, this replicates Mises' experience in Austria. And, uh, Mises, uh, the best he could do for Hayek was to, was the uh, University of Chicago Economics Department rejected Hayek as being reactionary and Neanderthal and whatever. But they found a, he found an unpaid post forum in the, in the Committee of Social Thought in Chicago, which is a highly prestigious graduate department. But the, the problem with that is uh, if, you, if you graduate with a PhD in social thought, where do you teach? I mean, there's no, there's no, there are no departments of social thought any place. So it's, it's very difficult uh, to get a... Uh, teaching position, do anything with it. Usually they end up in history departments, but it's kind of difficult. You're not a certified historian, which is, we all know is very difficult in any, in any field to break through the crust. So, but Hayek gets an unpaid post. In other words, the Volcker Fund paid for his salary. <clears throat> Hayek's salary. And Mises, the Volcker Fund paid for his salary. He's a visiting professor at, the, at NYU in the Graduate School of Business Administration. But the, his ma the major influence that Mises had was a, was a, was a, a private seminar, which he gave in his every week in the uh, in the Department of Commerce offices, Chamber of Commerce offices, and it was a magnet for all, for all the top students in Europe, all the top young social scientists and economists and philosophers in Europe, and even the United States and England, I came to this, because this was the great center of, of research for, for, from the night, early 1920s until 1934. And he tried to do, replicate this with us in the United States, and unfortunately, I, I, was, I felt very sorry about it, because the, the, the caliber the students there were not exactly up to almost Vienna par, so to put it very, very kindly. He did totally uncomplaining, didn't he was pressed on and was, uh, did, did his very best to uh, stimulate, as I said, research and students. Uh, and, uh, and this was a period from 19, 
when he was here from the mid 40s until 19 until he died in 1973 it was sort of like as i said a candle in the darkness there were very few austrians very few free market people even when the free market became more respectable there were almost no austrians and uh uh, and, but he, as I say, pressed on. He was extraordinarily productive and extraordinarily cheerful in this whole in this whole process. Uh, when he died in 1973, uh, he, the, the, just coinc coincidentally, uh, uh, in 19, the next year, that was the year 73, 74, of the, of the great collapse of, of Keynesianism, because that was the first year when the the, the process of uh, so-called stagflation or, or inflationary recession became evident. There were, it happened before a little bit, but it wasn't evident. All of a sudden, 73, 74, uh, is, is an inflation, 13, 14 percent inflation, so-called double-digit inflation. And at the same time, it was a big recession with unemployment and bankruptcies and all the rest of it. What are you, do, what are you supposed to do about this? Uh, Keynesian doctrine, of course, is very simple. I mean, the, the equations are complicated, but the, 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 the practical conclusion is very simple. Uh, the, the government is the great macro steering wheel or whatever. The, 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 the economic system is wonderful in the micro sense, but in the macro sense it's totally without an anchor, without a rudder. It needs a great helmsman, namely, of course, the government, provided the government is steered by, by, by Keynesian economists. That's, of course, a key. And uh, looking at the controls and the indicators and statistics, if, if, the, if the Keynesian economist finds that there's a recession and prices are falling and all that, you pump in spending, usually, of course, meaning government, increasing government budgets. Um, if you find there's a, uh, there's a boom and there's prices going up and so forth and inflation, then you take out spending, mainly you, almost always, of course, by increasing taxes, never by cutting the government budget, by the way. This is, this is, a, this is part of the Orwellian memory hole of, Ke of original Keynesianism. <laughs> so you increase taxes by sopping up, quote, excess purchasing power. In other words, we have the excess purchasing power after the government has already inflated the money supply and we've all gotten it, then we, we become excessive and they have to sop it up, sop it away again. It's sort of a one-two punch to the economy, to the, to the people. Uh, so here we have a situation, however, where they have two things happening at once. Inflation, prices are going up, and yet there's also a recession. What are you supposed to do? Do you pump in spending and you take it out? You can't do both at the same time. It's by all the equations and computer or whatever. You can't pump in spending and take it out at the same time. So they were, they were finished. I mean, especially Keynesian has been dead from the neck up since 1974. <laughs> It doesn't mean they quit. Nobody ever quits. It's one of Rothbard's laws of sociological laws. I have a whole bunch of them which I've evolved over the years. And one of them is nobody quits. <laughs> now, it's, not, it's not an apodictic law like praxeology. Once in a while, somebody does quit. But it's a tremendously empiric good, good empirical generalization with high predictive value. <laughs> okay. So uh, <clears throat> it's coherent, and it has great predictive value. At any rate, so they, they hang in there. They try and do the best they can. They pump in a little bit of spending, take out a little bit of spending, hope that something works. In this situation, in this, in this real collapse of Keynesian, I mean, Keynesian theory had a lot, a lot of weaknesses before. Ever since Modigliani's first equations, it became evident that it assumes the wage rates are, are, are fixed downward, which nobody really realized before. But uh, a, practical, a practical political collapse is much more important, and, and unfortunately, in real life, than a theoretical collapse. So uh, with this political collapse, Keynesianism, as I say, was, was really bankrupt. And this, this begins to dissolve the ruling hegem hegemonic paradigm and people looking around for other answers. Uh, the next year, Hayek gets the Nobel Prize. And one, one of the interesting, oh, in, in tandem, of course, with the left-wing socialist Gunnar Myrdal. It's not to make it too, no, too terrible and reactionary. And the interesting thing, this is a big shockeroo to the economics profession. And one thing I, I, I want to stress here, I don't want to disillusion any young students here, but economists are almost all of them obsessed with the Nobel Prize. I mean, they, there's betting pools every, every, in the early fall. Who's going to get it this year? Uh, and, there's, and there's all sorts of stuff going on. Everybody's very interested in the Nobel Prize and who's getting it. Before Hayek, as I remember, all the recipients, almost without exception, were mathematical Keynesians, Keynesian econometric types. And, uh, all of a sudden, Hayek gets it. Who the hell is Hayek? Nobody had ever heard of him. See, one of the things about the economics profession, they're not exactly steeped in their own history. I mean, if, if, a, if something was written 10 years ago, nobody, nobody knows about it because it becomes, it's part of the model of physics. If, if, uh, if economics is a hard science like physics, which all these people hope, it, hope and think it is, then you know, physicists don't read 1930s physics unless they're antiquarians and interested in what Einstein did or something. Basically, you leave the latest journal articles, the latest textbooks, and that's it. You don't worry about what some bozo thought 20 years ago. And so trying to make this the, the, the paradigm of, in, in economics, 
The result is a tremendous loss of knowledge on the part of uh, most economists. So who's Hayek? How can, he, how can this guy get the Nobel Prize? Who is he? And then it becomes a resurgence because people look back, they want you know, to find out what did he say that earned him the Nobel Prize, and buy him, well, this is interesting, I never heard of this. So, uh, so with this research, unfortunately, some of us conspir conspiracy theorists, uh, this is of course a totally unproved hypothesis, been cherished by many, I don't necessarily hold it, but some of my friends do, is that the, um, they want, but see, the point is that Hayek got his Nobel Prize not for this later stuff, not for evolution and, and the rule of law and that sort of thing. He got it for his Misesian business cycle theory, which he had expounded and elaborated in the late 1920s and early 1930s. That's what he got it for explicitly. Uh, so the uh, conspiracy hypothesis is that uh, uh, they waited for Mises to die before they gave Hayek the Nobel Prize, because Hayek, Mises died in 73, Hayek gets it in 74, and they, they, were, they would never give a, a Nobel Prize to a monster like Mises, so they, they, so they waited until Mises to die for giving it to Hayek, um, who was much, much more of a compromiser. If you read his Constitutional Liberty, for example, it's, there's pro-planning stuff, pro-status stuff all over it. <clears throat> so uh, the, um, at that point, this sort of sparked a regeneration or revival of Austrian economics. It, 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 it might not be a total causal connection, but it certainly is an impressive coincidence that uh, at least the, the first Austrian seminar since old Austria occurred, uh, in a conference, a week-long conference occurred in Royalton, Vermont in the summer of 74. Well, all the younger, whatever Austrians there were, were gathered together. It was a wonderful thing, because we all met each other for the first time, mostly. What, you're an Austrian? Well, fantastic, and it's just like uh, saying the catacombs. And, um, and, and Austrianism flourished, as, of course, it was a shame that Mises didn't live to see this, and uh, after fighting all his life for these ideas. Uh, and, uh, and then we had annual conferences for several years after that. It was a big flourishing uh, movement, and Austrianism was, uh, and it, uh, it was, was becoming uh, known and, and widely, uh, widely interested, people were widely interested in, in, in England and the United States. And then something happens, light suddenly goes out. See, the history of thought and history in general is not an onward and upward into the light, it's a series of glitches. It's, up, it's sort of like a, I wouldn't say a business cycle, but ups and downs, a zigzag effect. So suddenly there was a big zag after this impressive zig of the late 70s. <clears throat> uh, something happened, and the, the Austrian, Austrian, younger Austrians at the time started saying, well, uh, the trouble with Mises is he's too dogmatic, too uncompromising, too, uh, too extreme. Uh, we can't, how, how do you get respectable in the mainstream of economics if you keep pushing these ideas that nobody really likes? And the, we, should really, we should try to become respectable. We should drop all this stuff about uh, praxeology and laissez-faire and talk about Talk about market, market process, um, uh, whatever, and and uh, and the dread name Mises begins to slip out of out of sight, <clears throat> and um, the uh, and this is uh, this is of course really replicating in death what Mises had suffered in his life, except this time it was uh, it was essentially a stab in the back by people who had called themselves Misesians who understood the situation and then basically sold out. If you can just look at it very bluntly. Uh, sold out for, for potential respectability f funds, uh, mainstream publications, tenure, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> well, in this uh, rather red, dire situation, and uh, uh, it's not an accident, by the way, that the funding sources, uh, almost a single funding source for this whole revived Austrian movement in the late 70s, which was flourishing fairly, very, neat, very nicely, was one person, one billionaire, and the, and the billionaire had a paradigm shift in his head, and all the other, all the other uh, acolytes, so to speak, or, or fundees by the Benier, suddenly and coincidentally shifted with it <coughs> uh, in, into this idea of, and, and we began to hear, as I say, not only the Mises are too extreme and too dogmatic, you know, talk about him, we began to talk about synthesis with Marxists. This has been this is the latest late development since like 1980 or so. It's important for Austrians to really have to understand the great contributions of Marx and Lenin and so forth, and we should keep, have a continuing dialogue <laughs> I'm sure Yuri would appreciate this. <laughs> and flight from the Soviet Union to come to the United States or Austrians to find out, hey, we should have a synthesis with Marxists, right? Let's join in. Uh, or a synthesis with nihilism. And uh, there's no truth. How do we know anything is true? And all sort of fashionable philosophic guff. Uh, Marxo-Freudian nihilist uh, guff from the continent. And uh, this, this was, became, was becoming the ruling paradigm because the, the billionaire funder was in favor of it, basically. I, mean, I, I, I don't want to have a simplistic monocausal analysis here, but that's the, that's the way it looks to me. 
In this situation, in this rather, you know, pretty grim and depressing situation where Austrianism has really collapsed, because Austrianism, as I said in the first last week, uh, is really Misesianism. Uh, in this situation, one person uh, decided to do something about it. This person is Lou Rockwell, who is responsible for everything we have today. Uh, well, Lou had been, see, Lou, all these other people, the, the Austro-Marxists, or whatever you want to call them, were moving to Washington. They liked Washington. They thought this is where the power is. This is where you can get goodies and respectability. Lou had spent a lot of time in Washington, hated it, wanted to get out, both spiritually and physically. Okay? And, uh, and he decided that he wanted to found a Mises Institute, which was the dream of his life, and he decided this is the time to do it. And uh, he wanted to revive the, Aust the Misesian paradigm, the name of Mises, and, and all the rest of it. And he went to the, uh, the, 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 the aforesaid billionaire, and he thought was a Misesi, and he said, well, I want to found a Mises Institute. And he was ordered not to do it. Kind of interesting point here. How, how could he be ordered since he wasn't an employee of this person? <laughs> he was ordered not to do it. You can't do it. And of course, Lou, if you, if, you ever, if you know Lou at all, doesn't accept these kind of orders <laughs> very, 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 not, very neatly. <laughs> So uh, Lou went ahead with no donations, no endowment, no pledges, no nothing, no, no big daddy billionaire, I mean, nothing. Just an idea and, and, uh, and tremendous energy and, and organizational genius, entrepreneurial genius of the highest order. And as a result, we have, we have uh, all this today, we have a fantastic Mises Institute. <clears throat> and, uh, and we have, uh, just to run down some of the things the Mises Institute is doing, which I think is important. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it publishes a quarterly, oh, by the way, in addition to the, uh, it publishes, I say, publishes a quarterly uh, annual journal, the Review of Wall Street Economics, which is now going semi-annual, by the way. Uh, I'm happy to report. It's, uh, it, it, and uh, by the way, the, the, Aust the Austrian journal was boycotted by these aforesaid ex-Austrians, uh, organized a boycott, which happily was not successful. And uh, the, uh, it, has, it, it publishes a, a quarterly Austrian economics newsletter, which is sort of like a quarterly discussion uh, a magazine in Austrian economics. It publishes a monthly free market, which is marvelous uh, for application of Austrianism in general and extremely successful. And uh, it, it publishes books, which are getting even more, we're going to be even more books in the future, talking about the future of Austrian economics. Uh, Kluwer publishers, which have taken over the review of Austrian economics, is extremely excited about the, about the future of Austrian economics, about, about the Mises Institute and the future of Austrian economics. Not because they're ideological buddies, I don't know what they are or not, but they see it as a great marketing, great prospect for the future. And uh, publishers are very astute in this, and uh, they, they particularly are quite astute. I mean, if they found, for example, Hans Hoppe's uh, Theory of Capitalism and Socialism, which they published, they were amazed to see which under Mises Institute auspices, that makes us he was a bestseller, an academic bestseller, being translated in many languages. So this is this deeply moved the cluer people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, uh, so we, and we have, we have, uh, we're going to have three books, books a year, I think, which Kluwer wants to publish, or Misesian type books, Mises Institute books. We have all sorts of books we publish on our own, pamphlets, uh, monographs, and, uh, and conferences we, we've been putting together for a long time and uh, building up to the, to the present one. Uh, also special conferences, like the Desocialization Conference I mentioned uh, last year, conferences on Keynes, on Marx, on, on the Federal Reserve System, and all these, com all these conferences are going into books. In other words, we believe, in a contrast to many other institutions, there's another institution which I won't mention, which is, believes that every conference is an end in itself. You've got a conference, and everybody should go home, and never, nothing should be published out of it. It's sort of, uh, and, and, and we believe quite, quite the opposite. Every conference should build on previous conferences. You have a conference, everybody loves it, they go home and they, have, they publish books out of it. It keeps, keeps the whole movement going, the ideas going. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we have these annual conferences, summer conferences. And the interesting thing about that is uh, that there's a certain orthodox mold. You know, things tend to fall in traditional customary molds. The customary molds from about started, which started, I think, in 1977, is you have a summer conference for one week, okay? You get four professors or something like that, around four, and each, each professor teaches to the whole plenary group, and each one teaches three, three times or four times or whatever. Well, this seemed to work pretty well, so everybody sort of fell into this mold, okay? And, uh, 
And what Lou realized a couple of years ago, Lou Rockwell realized a couple of years ago, this, this is, 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 is limited. Okay? In other words, you've got, you only have four professors, you only have a certain amount of students, and everybody gets the same thing. Why not have a university concept? Why not have, uh, why not have it so you can have a lot more professors? And we had a lot more, the thing is more professors are coming into the, to the movement. So you have a lot more people growing up into it. First, starting as students and then ending up as professors, like Mark Thornton. So as, why should we have these people also give and, and be here and also give their own particular expertise? In other words, have courses like a real university, okay? And, uh, and, then, you, and then we always had a problem in the old days in Austrian courses in the summer. Somebody would teach Austrian economics. Uh, and the level was always bad. In other words, there'd be all sorts of people there from, from high school students, the businessmen, the graduate students, the young professors, and everybody was always griping about the level because the, some people thought it was too tough, other people thought, thought it was too easy. How do you get the level? It was okay when they were teaching political philosophy or history because everybody you know, was more or less the same level. What do you do about economics? And so Lou got the idea, you separate it. You have elementary courses, you have intermediate courses and advanced courses, and you tailor each course to the needs of a particular student. And we wound up with a Mises University concept, which is a blockbuster. It's an unbelievable uh, example of creative in, uh, ideological entrepreneurship and uh, in, innovation in this field, which is a field which is not really recognized as a field, but should be. So, uh, <clears throat> so we had, and last year was a fantastic success, and everybody loved it. And this year, even, even more so. Each year is better than the preceding one. Uh, in this case, the weak theory of history seems to work. <laughs> so. Uh, and one, the only thing I, I, quite, I don't like about it, in a sense, is that it's like a real university. You don't see the, you want to talk to people, you want to talk to my friends or whatever. Oh, sorry, I have to go off to the next class. <laughs> but that's the, yeah, that's the inevitable as the university takes over, so to speak. So, uh, uh, and we, we have more faculty, more students, and, and different segregation, so to speak, by quality and, and, and depth of courses. As, as a result, people can come back year after year because they can take more advanced courses or different specialties and, and whatever. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, in addition to that, we have a, uh, we have, uh, oh, by the way, I should say that the, uh, there's, a, there's an unexplored field, I think I mentioned with Mises bureaucracy, unexplored field of economics and nonprofit organizations. It's almost not, not been worked on. People are interested in what can they work on in Austrian economics. Here's an area. How do you calculate? It's easy to see what you, how you calculate in profit-making institution, profit and loss. How do you calculate efficiency? How do you make sure that you don't have a bloated organization? It's very difficult. <clears throat> And um, unfortunately, many ideological organizations, whether libertarian or other, tend to become uh, bureaucratic. They tend to be overweighted with uh, dead wood, uh, overstaffed, under, underproduced, underproductive. Uh, the quality tends to go down. The emphasis tends to be on, on sh show rather than content. And what Lou has done as part of his entrepreneurial uh, magnificence, I think, what he's done is, is to have an organization here which is the highest, has the highest marginal productivity of any organization in the country, or bar none, a nonprofit organization in the country. Uh, in other words, fantastic output. Every person here is a very tight ship. I mean, the, the staff is about, I don't know, one third of any comparable organization. Each person is, is dedicated, extremely competent, and works very hard. And as you should probably all know this week. So, uh, and the result of this is, a, is, a, is the growth of the Mises Institute, both in, in content and, and quality and in quantity and, and in influence. <clears throat> Essentially, we've, we've, uh, we've beaten the, 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 uh, the Austro-Nihilists and the Austro-Marxists. I mean, they're, they're out of the picture. They've had it. And, uh, and doing it against tremendous odds, in a sense, against the odds of a, a billionaire opposition. In a sense, it's very much like Mises conquering in, in the long run over the odds that he faced. Uh, and... Uh, and one, uh, one interesting thing about, also about Mises' uh, strategy and general strategy and outlook, uh, we, we wanted to form a, an Aust a graduate school in economics. This, I forget now, it was the 1950s or 60s, somewhere around the dark ages. And uh, Mises was going to be the president of this graduate school. It was going to be called the American School of Economics. And, uh, uh, and he insisted, we, uh, we were on, uh, us younger people were on the board of trustees because they wanted younger, young blood. I mean, you, you know it was a long time ago when I was young blood, right? <laughs> so. Uh, and Mises kept saying, well, don't forget, when you, as you're doing this high, high theory and scholarship, don't forget to have continuing lectures to businessmen and the general public. At the time, I didn't really understand that. I mean, what, why does he keep making this point? But I understand it very well now, especially since Joe Salerno has pioneered and looking back over the Mises-Hayek uh, differences between Mises and Hayek on, on economics of social, socialism and also on, on the economic, on the general, 
on the, re on the rash rational versus the irrational view of exchange and specialization. Uh, the point that Mises was really making was that since he believed that people do change history, that ideas do change history, that people are conscious actors, and uh, their decisions really determine events, uh, it's very important for everyone, not just scholars, not just philosophers and, and economists, it's important for everyone, all the general public, businessmen and the public, to understand the importance of the free market, to understand that crippling the free market is death, I mean, literal sense. It leads to, directly to the, to the terrible situation in Eastern Europe from which they finally <laughs> got rid of, getting rid of. So that it's very important not just to get the, the high-flown journal articles, it's also an equally important to, to spread the, the, the basic truths of, of, of free market and laissez-faire and the evils of collectivism and, and interventionism, spread that to the general public and the business. And that was the point. It wasn't just sort of a, uh, a, sort of a uh, peculiar whim on the part of Mises. It was, it, was, it was rooted in his general strategic theory, theory of life and, and the importance of reason and ideas on, on historical events. The interesting thing about Mises, the more I, the more I read him and go back and, and read the stuff, the, more, the greater it looks. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. More insights come in as, it, as I reread uh, uh, human action or socialism or, or, or his great works. So, uh, uh, so looking to the future and looking to the, what, is, what, is the, what are the prospects uh, for Austrian economics, I think it's inherent in the current situation. Obviously, obviously it's not determined by, but certainly we, give, we get good, great leads to what we can expect in the future. Uh, namely, uh, I mean, just look at the fact that in, in Eastern Europe, the economists of Soviet Russia and Eastern Europe, Mises and Hayek are revered figures. Nobody reveres Keynes and Galbraith out there. I mean, they had it with, with socialism and statism. They're just trying to figure out how to get to what we've been advocating all this time. And uh, if that's true in a system where human nature is supposedly transformed, obviously it wasn't, it should be also true, of course, in, in the West and in the United States, we haven't gotten to the socialist stage yet. And, um, and with the growth of with the, with the power of ideas, I really think in the, in the long run, truth wins out. Of course, this is, could be a very long, too long a run for us to worry about, but, but I think it's, it's winning out right now in the short run, in that sense, in the medium run, if you want to put it that way. And, uh, and we have, uh, we have uh, 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 with the growth of the influence of Austrianism and Mises, and Mises Institute, and uh, the prospects look terrific. I mean, we're continuing growth, as I said, in quantity and quality. And I think one of, uh, one of the lessons of looking back on the Mises himself and the Mises Institute itself is, that, is, not, to, is not to cave in. in other words, not to think that you're going you're to, you're going to, don't, don't sell your soul for a mess of pottage, so to speak, because you're, that's what you're going to get, a mess of pottage, if that. What happens is that the, uh, in the long run, which is not very long, uh, these, these compromises and, and, uh, and caving in simply don't work. They don't, don't work pragmatically. In addition to the moral aspect of it, they just simply don't work. They're finally they're repudiated, and, and uh, whereas if you, if you follow what you believe, not only is it a very joyful thing to do it, you also win out, which I think we will. I think we're going to win. Vence Ramos. <laughs> Thank you.